Hello and welcome to Fly With Your Shadow, the podcast all about music, mental health and illness, and the mess that the COVID pandemic has made of it all. My name's Jeff Robson and this show comes to you from my home in Winnipeg, Manitoba. It's hard to believe, but it's been almost exactly a month since the last episode of this show. It certainly wasn't a planned absence, but I ran into a few roadblocks, mostly of my own creation. Part of my own struggles with mental illness involves living with a lot of fear and doubt and insecurity. I often build up unreasonable expectations for myself and for the things that I do, and I feel easily defeated when I don't live up to those expectations. I was having trouble getting through to some guests that I really want to have on the show, and I kind of let it get me down and stop things for a while. But eventually, with some support and encouragement from a few listeners, I realized that I didn't just have to go after big-name, bucket-list guests for the show. Often the most interesting stories can be found inside of the people that we know and love the best. It was great to break my drought by reconnecting with a dear friend and a favorite songwriter and performer that I haven't talked to in a while, and I really missed it. I'm Joe Nolan. I'm... uh currently living, residing in Edmonton, Alberta, full-time musician, performer, touring artist, but not so much these days. I think Joe Nolan is one of those true old soul songwriters. He's been writing songs that are deeper and wiser than his years for over a decade. He first came to my attention when Six Shooter Records put out an album called Tornado in 2014 and set him off on the road to promote it. His name was totally unknown to me at the time, but the label was well known to me, and the list of people who helped make that record was impressive. The album was produced by the great Colin Linden, who you heard on episode 3 of this show. As usual, he brought in his stellar backing musicians, along with special guests like Lindy Ortega and Tom Wilson. So the album got a quick listen from me, and I loved it from the start. As good as that album is, Joe has demonstrated some of the most remarkable growth that I've ever seen in a young songwriter and performer. He's truly dedicated to improving and learning as much as possible, and he'll settle for nothing but the best he can write and put out. I think that one of the reasons that I'm so drawn to Joe as a person is that we have similar personalities in a lot of ways. He also struggles with darkness and doubt and despair, but also finds a lot of joy and strength in music and especially live performance. Like me, I know he's been missing those live performances a lot. I know you'll enjoy this chat with my friend Joe Nolan. Dead ends and damaged hearts Old friends and beat up guitars I don't know nothing about being a star Except falling blue Falling blue for you All right, so so I'm uh, I'm hoping I can go through things in a in a bit of a chronological order here, Joe, because I think I think your career has gone through a couple of different interesting phases and hopefully hopefully this will this will all make sense in the end but uh i want you to take me back a little bit so you so the first we became aware of you you made a couple of records with colin linden down in nashville um and especially the second one got picked up uh, by a fairly influential label here in canada and it got out into a bunch of ears and it seemed like though well that was the first time we saw you but it seemed like you were already kind of hit the ground running you were you were touring all over the place is that is that a fair assessment and had you been touring a bunch before that or was that kind of the start of the madness i'd been touring a bunch before that um you know fairly i don't know if unsuccessfully is the right word but i'd been <laughs> modestly I'd been de- i modestly i'd been i'd been putting in the the miles and the hours on the road, um, long before all of that. Um, you know, a lot of the time, my first tour ever, I think I was 18 and I went to, uh, Vancouver and back with a guy named Daniel Moore, great songwriter, um, from here. And, uh, yeah, I mean, we, you know, 
for years it was playing shows to one or two people um if you were lucky you know there'd be <laughs> there might be more than that um so I, I had i had been you know quite um you know involved in uh in touring even though it wasn't i don't know how many it wasn't it wasn't necessarily it was more my education and, and uh, I think a lot of growing pains and uh, which I'm still going through. But um, I, I don't know how many heads I turned for a lot of years um, before, you know, before the, the Goodbye Cinderella and Tornado thing came out. I, I had made, there's three albums before that, which I don't even sell anymore. And I, I don't really want anybody to hear, but that was sort of uh, those two albums were sort of the uh, sort of a turning point um, for me in terms of, you know, it, putting me on the a map a little bit in a larger scale than than the other stuff. So, yeah, and that makes sense. I mean, I've seen you a, a dozen times or more, I'm sure, and uh, you've always been solo. Have you always been primarily a solo performer, or did you did you start with bands and then just go on your own from there, or what? I started in high school with a band. Actually, um, we never performed a show. We just played in. Uh, we just played in my buddy Braden's basement and uh, we never had a name. And I think we only had three songs and uh, you know, that was enough. And uh, you know, after that, I, you know, it's, it's funny. I, I always kept music really kind of close to me and never fully in school. Anyways, in high school, I, as soon as I got my driver's license, I'd go to, I grew up in Fort Saskatchewan. So I, there was, there was zero, art scene there um nobody to connect to nobody that you know our school was all about sports and that old story but um i i never really i kind of kept it you know really close to me never really told anybody what i was doing and i i just i was always kind of a solo guy um just searching for for my scene and, and my community and people like me and uh um so yeah i i I'd say 90%. Um, I was solo and then I had a band in Edmonton sort of through that whole mid period phase where, uh, there was a lot of things kind of hit the fan for me and, and I, I had a band in, in town here. Yeah. I want to get to that years. in a minute. Sure. Yeah. Anyways. So that, so yeah, solo. I've always been solo. Yeah. You're a young guy now, but I mean, you were, you were certainly a, a young guy when I, when I first met you, it's, it seems I don't know. It seems unusual for me to, to, for a lot of really young performers to want to be a solo singer songwriter. So, uh, what, what was kind of your inspiration for that? Like, did you want to be a rock and roll guy in high school? And then it just, how did it become that solo thing? Good question. I, I, I didn't, all I wanted to do was play music and, uh, and I, I kind of learned, really fast i remember the first time i ever sung one of my songs in front of anybody was actually at my parents house we were we had our cousins over and my folks were gone i think i was like 15 or something yeah i sung in front of my siblings and my cousins and and i started sung a song sort of a personal song i started bawling um immediately after and i had to run upstairs and and just lay in my bed and cry in my room and it was like I had no idea. I, I did not, I don't know what happened. I, I finished the song. It was the first time I'd ever, I think been vulnerable or shared something that I've created that I was really, uh, you know, um, true and honest about. And, and, uh, it was this moment my sisters still remember. And, and then I started, you know, I started writing a bit more and, and I started singing at our school celebrations at church and stuff. And, the first time I sung an original song was in front of like 400 of my peers at a Thanksgiving celebration. And, uh-huh. and uh, it was still to this day, the most nervous I've ever been performing. Um, but the, the reaction was everybody started clapping and shouting in the church and the priest was getting pissed off because you're not <laughs> supposed to clap in church and make noise. And, and from there it just kind of felt like, Holy smokes, man. I, I think I've, I found my thing and I don't want to do anything else. Yeah. And I, and since that, since that moment, I've, I haven't 
wanted to do anything else. So it, it was more about me just finding um, sort of my my place in the world. And, uh, and that was, there was no more pinnacle moment than that. And so it wasn't as much about rock and roll. I, I you know, I, I think I've just always been drawn to, to songwriting and lyrics. And a lot of my favorite artists are um, really lyric focused. So I, I, I just figured, yeah, just, you know, just do it solo. So. And the thing that, I mean, one of the many things I love about you is, is your music is so vulnerable and honest. Those words that you mentioned in there, um, Mm -hmm. was that, uh, I mean, when you sang that song for your family and then when you did it again, that must've been really difficult, but Mm -hmm. did you automatic, did you already feel like some sort of catharsis for through doing that right away? Or was it just the reaction you got or what was it that kept you coming back? Absolutely. It felt, uh, like I said, I mean, <clears throat> it, nothing had ever felt so right in my life, <laughs> even though it was the scariest thing I'd ever done because I am to this day, it, it's kind of ironic, but I'm, I'm a pretty shy and uh, closed off kind of guy. And I don't really, um, I, I, I keep things pretty close to me and I don't like to give a lot away and, I, and I'm, and I'm, not really a, a, a big presence in a room full of people. Um, so yeah. So when I did that, it, it was really sort of, I was really putting myself out there and, uh, and it just felt so right. And, uh, I just felt like this is, this is like exactly what I need to do. Um, so yeah. Obviously it's, it's good that you were able to keep going and like that. And, and like I said, after those two records, it's, it seemed like you were touring like crazy for those records. Is, is that, is my assessment correct? I was, at that time? I was, yeah, I was, um, I was, yeah, I was, I mean, I had done, I was doing Europe a bunch. My first trip to Europe was during Goodbye Cinderella and I was on a tour with Lydia Lovelace, um, who I didn't know at the time. And, that was my first experience of Europe and, uh, well, actually my second, uh, experience, but, uh, it was, um, yeah, I was busy and things were cooking and, and, uh, I was, I was on top of the world. I felt like, wow, this is, things are going really well, and, you know? Um, but it's, uh, it's a funny thing, this industry, that's for sure. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> um, and yeah, yeah w- without, <clears throat> without getting into, anything too uncomfortable it seemed like a certain point like all of a sudden you just kind of stop touring as much and and i wasn't quite sure for a while where you had gone you just you just we were so used to seeing you so often and then it seemed like you were just home all the time yeah i mean um there was a lot of factors involved in uh in the reason why uh, I kind of became a ghost. I, and it, it wasn't, it wasn't like I wanted to, I'll tell you that much. Um, nothing, there's nothing more than I want every day than to be working all the time and, and playing. It's, 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 uh, it's what kind of brings me the most, fills my soul the most. Um, I, uh, you know, honestly, Jeff, like my early twenties were, uh, there's not really a word for it. it there's a, there was a lot of shit going on and, and, uh, and I didn't, I couldn't handle it all. And I, and I, uh, spiraled really bad. Um, and, uh, you know, had people from every corner, you know, telling me what I should be doing and what I shouldn't be doing. And, and, um, um, I, I had, you know, I have a memory of, of being in Nashville, uh, for the Americana, convention in that period of time where nothing was really going on for me and i remember uh, meeting up with my my agent who i'd lost at the time um at mongrel music in in florida and they my manager at the time neil mcgonagall hooked me up with them and they were stoked and really on board and and then there was just nothing went on for like three years um i i had this i sat down with this guy brad madison at the bar in nashville he said Joe, like, we've we've been sitting in our office wondering what what happened to Joe Nolan, um, and I just I just sit, sat there and I I couldn't even answer him, 
and I, my heart just sunk and I was just like, what the fuck am I doing? And, you know, and, uh, for a long time, I, I just wanted to blame everybody else <laughs> for the, for the reasons why I was, you know, didn't have that much action going on and, uh, we can get into that if you want, but it's, uh, it's totally up to you. I'm not, I'm not trying to dig for dirt or push you in any no, yeah, particular no, direction, know, but just so people have an understanding kind of some of the things that go wrong in a, in a promising well, career. You know, and it's the sad thing is it's, it's actually not that uncommon of a story. Um, even though it might sound shocking to hear to some people, I, you know, I, like I said, I was, we put out goodbye Cinderella. I had, I had Sean DeCarci fly down from six shooter, um, to see, um, me and Russell Broom play. We, I was living in Calgary at the time and Russell and I, uh, Russell would join me a lot on, on guitar and we, we would play every Sunday night at this place called club Paradiso Lolita's lounge on, uh, right by the Ironwood in Inglewood. And, uh, yeah, she she my my manager Neil gave her the, a copy of the record. She said, I, you know, I love it, and she flew down and and she immediately wanted to sign us. And uh, and uh, I I don't know how old, I was probably twenty one or something. And uh, we we ended up turning Six Shooter Records down actually the first time. Yeah, she yeah we got offered a deal, and uh, I didn't know shit all, um, but apparently it was kind of a bad deal. It was seven years and two records or so. Anyways, you know, and so we, you know, I talked with it with Neil a bunch and, and I was heartbroken, but he, he convinced me, he said, you know, Joe, this, this ain't, this isn't a good deal. And so we carried on and, and we went down and made tornado the next year with, with Colin Lennon again in Nashville. And, and I felt like that record, um, I had grown a lot and and I, and I still feel really um yeah I'm, I'm really proud of that record there uh, it's it's hard for me to listen to in some ways just because I, I think you know today if I could redo it I feel like I've grown as a singer and all sorts of things but uh anyways we you know we we went forward and we did that and and uh, we got offered another deal from Six Shooter Records a year later and it was a way better deal and a way shorter term and uh all these great things and we we uh you know it was all i ever wanted i i sent maybe i'm saying too much but i sent uh i sent six shooter records an email when i was 17 years old and uh because i was going to toronto um for the first time in my life and uh and i said listen i you know i love your label i I, uh, I love Hoxley Workman. I'd, I'd love to work with him. Would you never heard back? Um, and then, you know, it's funny how things, and then I was maybe, you know, 22, 23 years old. And, and, and there I was, I had signed the deal of my life. Um, this label I always dreamed about. And it was like, I was on top of the world. And, uh, and I won't, I won't really get into details of, um, what you know what went down I, I don't want to speak ill of anybody but uh it came down to me um being very confused and just wanting i honestly jeff i think i wanted the fame and i i wanted to be noticed and i and it, i think i ended up not being myself and appeasing people and uh and it just got really ugly and uh and that's sort of how i transitioned into becoming a bit of a ghost for a while <laughs> It's, it's not just you though. And it's not just them or anything like, uh, you know, I've heard the same story so many times. Like I just talked to Amelia Curran, who's fresh left that label as well, uh, for a lot of the same reasons because, and, and she has no ill will towards them, but they said, so here's the things that we need to do in order to get your songs on the radio and get your songs placed and all these things. And we need to, you know, maybe have an extra guitar solo here and cut a verse there and, you know, make these videos a certain way because that's what you do to get successful. And she too wanted that as well. So went along with it for a long time, but eventually it just sort of starts to feel like, well, what is success if I'm not doing it exactly in ways that I, that I really believe in, that I really feel. 
And I think, I think if I've heard your story correctly, that's kind of what happened with you. you it, it started to be something other than perhaps what you intended. Yeah, absolutely. That, that was a, a big part of it. And I think for a while I just, you know, wanted to just play along and, and kind of do whatever anybody wanted me to do. And yeah. I, all I wanted was some success. And, um, but it was also, you know, I was, um, I had my own, I was drinking like crazy. Um, I was, uh, in a really, really toxic relationship. Um, mm -hmm. uh, anyways, it, it just, I was just too young. If I, if I could do it over, um, things would be a lot different. I, you know, I've learned, I'm really grateful for the experience because I've, I think I've come out of it full circle. Um, and it's okay that yeah, absolutely. it's made me, it's kind of made me who I am. And it, it took me a long time to get over all these things that, you know what, at the end of the day, it's like, I put out, I put out that song, put out a song recently called low lights. And, yeah. it, and it, it really is just about, um, stepping out of the shadow and, and, you know, a lot of the time, the things that make artists beautiful and great are, are their imperfections and yeah. their, you know, yeah. I, and, and a lot of the time that success and this, this false idea of what's going to make you or break you is it's, it's, it, it strips away all those beautiful things about us. And, and I think, you know, it's, 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 you got to step out of those shadows and just be yourself. And, and, yeah. and, and at the end of the day, who, who cares? If yeah. People, there's always going to be people that are not going to like your music. And <laughs> especially when it's not very commercial, which I, I don't see myself as being a commercial artist. And, uh, so <laughs> it's just, uh, it's, yeah, it's been a real growing experience and, uh, I'm grateful for it. Yeah. So when that, yeah. when that industry stuff, kind of fell apart um like did you feel like a failure at the time or did you feel like you your shot had been blown like what happened for you because it seemed like you kind of lost your confidence or you lost your your oh, real yeah. your desire for a while and again yeah. uh, you know i'm uh I, stop me if i'm going too but it sounds like it kind of exacerbated some of that self-destructive behavior Big or some time. of those unhealthy things that you had going on anyway Big time, and uh, honestly, the self-destructive behavior probably just got worse. Um, and I think that's that sort of factors into why I maybe wasn't as productive for a long time. Um, I uh, I was really living with a lot of demons, and yes, I mean, self-doubt has always been um, something I've struggled with even to this day, um, but I. I'm a lot more confident than I used to be. That's for sure. Um, just because I've accepted who I am as an artist and, uh, and I'm, and I'm confident in it. And, uh, but I, I lost a lot of, um, yeah, a, a lot of confidence and, and sort of just was like a dog with my tail between my legs and was just desperate for anybody to, to give me a bone, um, you know, and, uh, it was, yeah, it was a pretty dark time to be honest. And it's, the, I guess this is around the time that you hooked up with that band in Edmonton, right? And you started kind of, it was, you started kind of doing something a little bit, a little bit different. It was more of a, more of a rocking band than perhaps most of us know. You it for. was, it was. And I mean, we were called the dogs and, you know, we've never really broke, we never toured and, you know, had two of the guys, one of the guys is married and has kids and we, but we, it was just friends and, uh, playing music and, and, uh, it started out kind of as a, just a fun one-off Halloween show and it, and, uh, the response was really cool in Edmonton here. And it's my first time playing electric guitar and, uh, it, yeah. And it was, it was just full on rock and roll and, and, uh, and I had written all the songs we were playing were 
were songs that were written for the band that I, you know, not songs I was playing out during my solo career. And so, you know, it was, it was really cool and really neat. And we, we never, nobody's aware of it or anything, but we, we actually spent a weekend at a friend's cabin in Nordegg and uh, we, we've recorded about 25 songs that are still in the vault. I finally just got the files actually of them. So um, I hope, I hope they come to life someday. Um, it was, it was, it was a neat band. It was a different sound for me. And uh, yeah, I thought, I thought we were pretty good. Um, but it, you know, and nothing was ever going anywhere. And I was, I was just caught in that and kind of stuck in Edmonton and feeling stagnant and partying too much and all that stuff. So. Yeah. Well, that's the thing when you get hanging out with your buddies and you crank up the guitars and sometimes people kind of, use the loud guitars and the, and the partying with your buddies to kind of hide behind, I suppose. Were, were those yeah. songs or was that time, were you writing different stuff? Were you still writing kind of vulnerable stuff or was, or were you, had you kind of turned your back on some of that stuff for a while? I mean, I don't, I, I've never turned my back on those songs. They're, they're kind of not even up to me. Um, when they, when they happen, they happen. And, uh, I mean, the only thing that's up to me is whether I let them come through or I ignore them. So I, I was definitely, I mean, I don't know how many phones I've had, but I've, every phone's got about 1300 voice memos of freaking songs on it. So, so I was writing, but I wasn't bringing those more vulnerable songs to the band. We were more of kind of like a sexy uh, the lyrics were different. The, the group, there was a lot of groove and, uh, I just wanted to turn people on it. I wanted, I wanted to do something where people could party and drink and, and have fun and dance. And, you know, that is something that would work at times change, you know, kind of thing. So, yeah. So at what point did that kind of stop being fun or stop being productive? And then what happened from there? Well, honestly, I think it went on way too long and i think growth stopped for me and i just kind of became um you know content in in what we were doing and uh we were getting some f local festivals and stuff like that but i i just i i always felt like this isn't it's not good enough it's not this isn't this isn't where i need to be this isn't this isn't breaking any boundaries this is just a fun band and and i I mean, and then when it's with your friends, it's hard too because you don't want to let them down. Or, um, it, it, and uh, it just ended up kind of fizzling out. I think everybody in the band was, you know, really loving it. But I had to kind of come to full terms and start looking at my career again because it wasn't going anywhere. And uh, I had to, I kind of had to uh, make another move and, and change and, and start start being more serious again and so so that's yeah there, i don't know i don't know how it really i don't know what the real change was i just i think i just maybe grew up a little bit and and uh just woke up one day and just said i i, I can't i need to get i need to get back on the road i, I gotta i gotta i gotta conquer my my demons and this is too this is worth too much to me i i I don't want to be a ghost anymore. Yeah. So what do you do to, to, to conquer the demons? What do, what do you do to get healthy enough to be confident in going out and doing your own thing again? Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, I have some strategies. Yeah. Um, I still struggle. Yeah. Um, with that stuff every day i uh kind of describe it as like it's like this dark angel um yeah she's not the devil but she's kind of beautiful and and she's always outside my door and uh sometimes she knocks louder sometimes i let her in and uh sometimes i don't and um when i do let her in it is usually when i create the best art oh yeah um but it goes sort of hand in hand with um 
being in that that place that nobody I don't ever want anybody to know <laughs> yeah how what's actually going on with me because it's uh it's a dark place um and I think I'll probably have to deal with her my whole life um, yeah and uh so I just learning to find a balance between I don't need her to make music um but if I can be in control of her then that's where I think I can um, succeed and uh, not let her be in control of me, if that makes any sense. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. And I mean, that's, that's the reason why I'm doing this show. You know, I've struggled with depression and anxiety my entire life, and yeah. it's something that I've never felt comfortable talking about before until I started to realize how many of my friends were going through some of the th same things and not talking about them as well. So that's kind of what what I try to do with this show in particular is kind of have some of those uncomfortable conversations. So I believe me when I tell you, I know exactly what you mean about those things, okay. and I've I've been through all those you know those same sorts of issues. So uh, so yeah. So yeah, yeah. I appreciate that, Jeff. It's um, nobody. <laughs> I'm really good at. I'm really good at hiding and pretending that I'm fine. Well, yeah, that's, that's what most of us and do. Nobody knows. Right? Yes, exactly. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm a pro at it. And, um, but um, I've no, I feel you. I'm, I definitely go through the same things. So. Yeah. The people who struggle the most, we become the greatest liars or actors or something. Oh, yeah. We're really yeah. good at hiding what's really going on. Um, but I don't know about for you, but it, it, it takes so much out of me to try to pretend to be happy all the time. And the more I have to do that, the harder and the more dangerous, I guess it is. Me too. I, then I need to lash out in a different way. I, it's exhausting for me, but I also don't want to close myself off or just, it, it, it's, it, it intersects with being selfish and where, and how selfish should we be in, and, uh, and I think it's good to be selfish. You know, that's something I've had a hard time learning in my life. Like I always learned that being selfish was bad, but then I started to realize that, you know, in order to look after yourself, in order to be healthy, in order to be strong, in order to make good choices, you have to be a little bit selfish. You have to look out for yourself because so often nobody else is going to do it for you, you know? So there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with that. And having a little bit of that selfishness or a little bit of that self-awareness anyway, in, and the ability to make tough choices or know when you have to look after yourself um, is ultimately what makes us stronger and makes us better people, I guess. I agree. I agree. Yeah. Rock and roll in the parking lot on a Saturday night. No one wants to get shot. The cops I guess Cry Baby, I guess we should talk about that record. Um, because that record you kind of made and it was really, it's, it's really different from the stuff that you were doing before. Um, and at first it kind of sound, I got to admit the first time I heard it, I kind of went, what the fuck is he doing? But the more I listen to that record and I still listen to it all the time, the more I listen to it, the more I really start to understand and appreciate what an amazing artistic statement it is. When you were making that record, was that kind of a goal or did you know that you were doing something different and something that was going to ruffle a few feathers from people who knew you already? And did it matter? Uh, it did matter. Um, it mattered to me. I, uh, and that was 100% the vision behind it. Um, completely, I knew before I made it exactly what I wanted to do. And, uh, and I was blessed with, uh, with, uh, you know, a few people in my life who supported me when I hit the bottom and, uh, and, uh, I was at the point of honestly quitting, um, pretty close before that record happened. I, uh, I was scraping quarters out of my Toyota Echo and uh, seeing if I could scrape up five bucks for a beer. Um, I had 
I was so done. I was so done. I, I didn't know how to move forward. And, um, and I was blessed with, uh, a couple investors and, and patrons who helped me make that record. And, uh, it's funny because I actually had before making cry baby, I had in Edmonton, I had reached out to Colin Lennon about doing a third album with him. And, uh, and then I just decided, you know what, I need to do this my way and I need to be in control and I need, I need to realize my vision for this album. And, and I knew that if I went with Colin again, it, the pro the result probably would have been really cool and beautiful, but it would have been, I would have been, there would have been battles for, um, artistic decisions and all that sort of stuff. So I, so I hooked up with Scott Franchuk in Edmonton and, and we talked, we met up a few times and, and, uh, it just seemed right. And it just seemed like he was willing to, to guide me to realize my vision. And, and that record, um, I'm really proud of it. And I knew that when people listen to it, maybe it's, maybe they wouldn't get it the first listen through, but I, I, my hope was that it would grow on people the more they listen to it. And, and maybe they could, um, see the, the intention I had behind it. And, uh, and, and, and it, in that matter to me, I, I just wanted to come out and, and make a statement, um, and kind of show, you know, all of my, in some ways I feel like a chameleon a little bit because I, I just wanted to make a record that showed sort of my most rock and roll, like seven minute, just full on banger, like Black Oak Drunk on that album. And the vocal is really pitchy. And I, I just wanted to leave it as it was. And then I wanted to do a song like another dead poet on there as well to show sort of my singer songwriter side and, and hope that it sort of could round itself out to, uh, to being something that was truly me. I'm tired of singing for their design. Toss another dollar across the finish line. The girl behind the counter with the broken eyes. She's the only thing in here make me feel alive. Of any record, a, a lot of a lot of people are really uh, um, tuned into that one. It seems like so. Yeah, that's kind of so the, I, the, the 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 irony I'm getting at here is that you had this label and stuff, and and you know trying to make you successful, and then you go and do a record that by commercial standards, I think we could call it a little bit weird because it's, it's certainly not (laughs) all one thing. It's a bit all over the map. Um, and it's a bit of a bolder statement, but that seems to be the one that really helped you break through in a lot of ways. Absolutely. Yeah. It it kind of felt like I, uh, (laughs) crawled out of a grave or something and I, and I, I wanted to say I'm back, you know, I wanted, I wanted to say I'm back, I'm here. And, um, and I, and I, you know, I, I hope that it kind of achieved that, um, you know, so. For sure. Yeah. And I mean, it, it certainly seems to have worked in a lot of ways and gotten mm-hmm. you some more attention and some more things. And then, um, was it just a natural that you would just start touring all the time once that record was out? Was that a, yeah. was that a comfortable thing to slip back into? It was, it was, it's, it's always been. It, you know, it, it, I had to shake off a few, you know, dusty parts, but it, it, uh, it, uh, no, it, it was, um, honestly, Jeff, there's nothing more than I love touring and, and, and by touring for me and touring solo, um, through all those years, I'm really, you know, I continue to develop my live solo show which is, which continues to grow and it, and it, and it's getting stronger and stronger and the more i the more i get to be on the road the more i learn and and actually like these songs kind of change and come to life and and uh it's 
one of my goals is really to put on a dynamic solo show, which is, which is a huge, um, it's a never ending thing. And it's a real challenge, um, to, to hold people's attention as if they were to give them something to leave and, and, and remember, you know, that can be as strong as a full band. Um, and that's, that's kind of my, been my focus and my goal when I'm, when I've been doing all these shows on the road in the past since Crybaby is, is developing that, that live solo show. Um, and it's, 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 it's really helped me, you know, it's challenged me and it's helped me grow a lot. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm the yeah. guy, I, I love to watch an artist from their very awkward beginning and then watch them <laughs> kind of go. And yeah. I mean, your transformation from the guy I saw the very first time to the guy I saw the last time is remarkable. Yeah. It's, it's almost like you're an entirely different person. And I'm, I mean, I thought you were great back then, but, uh, the command that you have, and I guess the pinnacle for me was, uh, you and I were at a festival in Germany called the static roots festival. And, um, it's, it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a different festival. There's not a lot of solo performers there. Like we usually have maybe one or two at the, at, at the festival and they're not, uh, I'm not always as engaged by the solo. Per I'm the singer songwriter guy. I've hosted a singer songwriter yeah. show yeah. for nearly 20 years. And I'm not afraid yeah. to say that one of the most boring things in the world sometimes is just a dude with a guitar. Oh, like for sure. so yeah. often, like after 40 minutes of that, I'm just, I'm, <laughs> I'm done. Get me out of here. Yeah. Um, yeah. but yeah, you managed to turn it into something that, uh, that was so far above what I'd seen before from, from you, but for sure. But even from most live performers now, I don't think I'd seen you for a while before that festival. Um, so was that, uh, was that indicative of, of the show that you were doing up to that point or, did something special kind of click in that room? Because I certainly felt like it did, but you tell me how different was that from the, from the Joe, if I'd seen you a month before. Sure. I, I think I was, I don't think it was any different um, from what I'd been doing. Um, nothing was different. It was, I think the difference was, it was um, received and accepted um, in a way I'd never experienced. Um, I'd been doing that show for a year. I mean, um, all over the place. Um, you know, it, there. but there's something that happens when everybody's together in a room in a moment and, uh, and nothing else matters. You, nobody is nobody's thinking about anything else except for what's happening. And that, and that happened there. And it was one of the highlights of my life because I, I felt so, um, understood. Um, and it felt like one of the first times where I felt f fully understood for what I've been working on. And, uh, it was very special. Yeah, it was a highlight of my life. It, um, but I, to be honest, I, nothing was nothing changed i i had been doing that um that show i i think i had a i was on a tour with a band i won't mention um in in europe uh you know it was an extensive tour i think there was i was there two months um playing every night and that so that tour really um sort of uh got me ready for uh you know um this helped hone that show for that audience yeah exactly exactly but there was something special when when something like that happens like at the static roots festival uh, when all of a sudden everybody's together and it's like one thing it's not about me it's not about anybody else it's just this one thing happening when that happens it allows me to take some risks i would never i would never have sung um a couple of those songs at a, at a tour in europe or ever at a bar well there's one you just written like the night before you saw you saw john murray and then went home and wrote a song kind of inspired by that experience and 
you know, things like that are a bit of a, it's a bit of a bold thing to do. But it's funny because the audience allowed me to do it. And, uh, and that's, I think when you, when you're in something like that, when it's happening live, um, the audience allowed me to do it. And that's what makes that's what I think may, can make things special. And uh, I was just allowed to be Joe. And um, for so long, I mean, 90% of my shows, I'm fighting the audience. And I didn't have to fight. I got to be me. And uh, and I definitely got to be a little bit more vulnerable um, because I was just going with the flow in it. And I, I, felt, I felt like, okay, this, you know, this is something that you know, I can... I can share some of these things that I, they're just too hard to share when not when everybody's not together. There's no way I'm gonna sing. I, you know, I, I can't sing a song. Um, one of my songs called "Old Disturbing County." I I can't sing it unless it's gonna be unless we're all together. It just doesn't work. It's too hard for me. So that was so that was that it was. I it wasn't credit to me. It was credit to the happening that was going on there. Well, it's a, mar- it's a remarkable community there. I mean, everybody knows sure everybody is. and that we've all come together cause we all have a, a, a love of our friend Dietmar and uh, just trust that it's going to be an amazing time. So it's, so it's a bit of a unique situation. It's kind of like a house concert on steroids in a way, like, right. you know, yeah. where everybody knows each other, but um, right. we're all there in this, place partying and having fun but at the same time everybody is hyper focused on the music and uh, you don't you don't dare talk during most bands um you know people just appreciate it more yeah it's special man and your show and i mean uh you know i i know that you probably think i'm saying this but i've seen every (laughs) band at that festival from the from the very first till the till the very last and i've never seen anything stop time the way you were able to in that show i mean everybody i'm sure everybody was crying at some point during that show and i just remember looking around that the guys around me feeling like oh my god i hope nobody sees that i'm so (laughs) emotional at this show and i'm like everybody else is exactly the same it was it was something else so i mean i'm my all the hairs on my arms are standing on it just thinking Hmm. about it like it was it was something special and something fun. And then, so are you like, for me, when I go to, when I go to something like that, I kind of take that energy and it fuels me for a while. Did that kind of reaffirm things for you and help you to go home stronger and more dedicated or? 100%. Yeah. I, uh, it, uh, it did. I, in some ways I got a lot of confidence back doing that. And, uh, and it, it, it certainly has helped me move forward and, and, uh, to this day, I mean, um, it's, it's just made me, it, it's, it's just sort of reaffirmed that it's okay. And that I, and that I'm, and that I'm, and that I'm, I'm doing what I should be doing. Cause as I mentioned earlier, there's, well, there's always self doubt and, and, uh, you know, self consciousness and all sorts of things that go along with, with, the you know, being involved in, in this industry. And, and, uh, it, it was really, um, reaffirming for me. And, uh, I, yeah, I, I really was, uh, I was just felt so grateful and it was, it was very special. No, I ain't saying words like love. I don't say much these days. All the things I was thinking of I can't use to explain Guess I couldn't decide Maybe we just didn't get our time in line So where and when did the songs that uh, eventually became Drifters come about in the chronology there? Like because it's another sharp turn like it's it's nothing right, like cry totally. baby whatsoever it's almost entirely right. solo it's very stark very mm-hmm. uh very vulnerable songs again but uh where did those where and when did those songs come in a lot of those songs are old i think half of them were 
really either like really old and just had never been recorded and then the other half yeah and then the other half i mean some of those yeah a few of those songs i wrote when i was 18 um ish and then the other half were brand new i i had written probably the five of them in you know a week before we recorded it and honestly that record was just sort of uh i just i just felt like it it had been a while since i put anything out and i didn't have any cash and i just thought okay well you know i I had this really cool it's broken now but i had this really cool uh tascam two two dash four four uh four track reel to reel and uh scott franchuk the guy who did crybaby i i just said hey man can i could we could i come in for a day or two and just track a bunch of songs and i want to you know, I want him to be recorded on my reel to reel. You can do it better than me. So he said, sure. And and we did it. Um, and then I just, it was just kind of like a, I don't know what the word would be, but it was just sort of a meant to be something to lead to the next album. Just kind of tied just, people over. And just, so exactly, exactly. Sell a, just sell a few, a, make a few bucks and then earn exactly. some money to, to make another proper record. Exactly. And uh, so we, yeah, we did it in a day um and there's there's 10 songs there's another 10 songs that never made it on the album from that session um that i'll probably release at some point but um it ended up you know i i didn't really have any expectation or plan for it um but i honestly jeff i don't i don't really think about i mean maybe it's maybe i confuse people and like well what's joe what is this crybaby? And now this is the stripped down acoustic record and what's going to be next. And, and I, I think that's okay. I think it's all me. It's all me. It's, um, it's original. And, uh, so, so yeah, we, we, uh, I was just going to like, you know, just say, Hey, put it out on Spotify and just say, Hey, here's a, here's a few songs. Um, but it, it ended up, you know, um, it, it, it did, it, it got a, if not and, and you know i never really expect anything and i always hope for good things but uh it did exceed my expectations from what i had planned for it to do it kind of it kind of just kept the train rolling for a little bit longer um until the sort of next you know more uh produced record um was going to come out so and kind of around then you, you you found another kind of record label to work with, right? You're I did, yeah. Working with Fallen Tree. Yeah. Yeah. They're a local label here. Um uh and uh Peter Peter Chapman runs the label uh here in Edmonton and it's been a really nice guy and uh, it's been a totally different relationship than I've uh had with other my other label experience. So it, it's it's been really cool and and he's, you know, he's he's worked really hard and, and gave that album some legs that I probably couldn't have done on my own um, at the time, just putting it out. So it's been good. Well, I guess the other uh, the other obvious point is it, it came out last year. I'm, I'm guessing the the plan was a little different. Now, what I know about you is that, <laughs> like, literally at the exact same time the the pandemic was really starting was when you had this plan to leave Edmonton, you were going to go to Mm -hmm. Toronto and then you were going to go to Nashville and you just, you said, I've had enough of Edmonton. I need to go live Mm -hmm. somewhere else for a while and really dive into this. So your plan was to, from, from what I, from what you've told me or from what I understand, your, your plan was to give it your all uh, at that time. (laughs) And then, and then of course the rug gets swept out like like you had that house show, I think it was the beginning yeah, of April right. on your way yeah, out of town. Yeah. And it was like, right when things yeah. got crazy and there was some question like, do I come and do it anyway? Yeah, <laughs> like, right. like it yeah, was that, it was that oh, new in the pandemic and that's how close you were to this. And then, you know, you get s- stuck in Edmonton, the place that you were yeah. dying to leave. <laughs> yeah. Was that, no, that's well put that's that's the truth yeah was that hard again and did that kind of did you did you take that hard oh yeah did you have to 
pull yourself up again? Yeah. Yeah, I did. Um, it was trippy. It was really trippy. And, and for, you know, all those first few months, it was kind of like, you know, you're just like waiting. You're like, Oh yeah, no, this, okay. This, you know, I was, I was so excited to go to, I had my, you know, my flights booked to go to Ireland for the first time to do Kilkenny. And that was in, that was in May. And I was like, okay, well, all right, well, we'll just, we'll just sit around and we'll be fine. You know? And then the June shows, we're like, oh yeah, for sure. June is, you know, I'll be, be doing these things. So it, it just kind of like, you were kind of always like day by day, nobody really knew anything. And I, I, so I was, I was okay for a while. Cause I just thought, okay, you know, it's not the end of the world. I, I don't get to do this, but you know, I'm okay. I got everything I need. And, um, and then it sort of, it, it really hit in, um, in the summer and, uh, I was just kind of back in a place of like, what the fuck am I, what do I, what can I do? I like, you can only do so many live streams. You can only, it was just, it was a pretty depressing time for me. Um, It's true. I, you know, I, I had just gotten back from a really good tour um, in Europe. And then, and I was, I was house, I got back like, march 1st or something and then i was i didn't have a place to stay i had moved out of my place i was basically ready to pack my van i was house sitting i was house sitting my old friend brian's apartment his 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 neighbor's apartment downtown edmonton and uh and they were getting back like march 10th or something and i had all my stuff i had my van packed and i was i was headed to do that studome show in winnipeg and then I was headed to Nashville. I had I had the SoCan house booked in Nashville. And I was going to hang out there for a month, and uh, and then go to Toronto because I I had a show opening for Charlie Musselwhite at the Horseshoe. And uh, yeah, it was it was everything was looking like I had finally I had finally made the call I've been wanting to make since I was twenty years old. I've always known I had to get out, and. Uh, and I think it was just, I just think I was never brave enough. And, uh, I was finally there. I was there. I had made peace. And, uh, and then, uh, you know, as everybody knows, shit hit the fan and I had nowhere to go. So I, I had to call my, my sister and They, they were running an Airbnb, um, in their basement of this house they were renting. And, uh, so I had, I crashed there for, till things sort of uh you know figured themselves out and and it's you know it's all okay i in some ways i'm it's been it's been good um i've been a little bit more introspective and and uh, have dug a little bit deeper into uh, myself and my my day-to-day struggles and stuff and uh and i and i just i, I feel like i've set myself up to be ready for when things can, you know, get back to rock and roll. So. Well, that's good. Like hopefully you've, I, I mean, you joined Patreon and hopefully that's helping yeah. you financially. And I know, and I know for a lot of artists, you know, having that continual community of people that, you know, are there for you and are waiting for your songs and stuff certainly has helped a lot of people. And I know you've, you've done a few of the live streams and, I don't know. I would be fine seeing a few more personally, but you know, <laughs> yeah. whatever. So are you feeling all right about it now? And, uh, just waiting for things to open up again. And then is that plan back on the books? Like, is that kind of on hold it, or? It is. I'm, um, I'm getting my arm stabbed with a needle on Thursday and, uh, I've never been so excited for a needle. In oh I, yeah. Me too. Uh, I hate the things, but I was like, Oh yeah, uh, I'm there. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So it's funny. I only until recently I've, um, had this surge of, of, uh, insane, uh, surge of, of writing and, and songs. I didn't write a single song from March when COVID hit till probably September. Um, which is a long time for me. 
Uh, yeah. And uh, I might have written one or something, but it wasn't very good. Um, and uh, and then I started sort of doing some stuff. I shifted gears and I said, OK, we're in this. We're, this is a long haul. I got to do something now so I can be ready when the gate opens. I want to be working, working, working. And I want to have something new that I can tour because as soon as the gates open, I'm not going to be having time to record or release anything new. So I, so I kind of shifted gear in September and, uh, and uh, started doing some sort of uh, undercover um, recording and working on an album. And, uh, and that's been, that's been my focus since then. And, uh, and then more recently, like I was saying, um, I hadn't written anything new until about two months ago where this sir, this, this thing, it's, it's just keeps on flowing. I, I think I've written 30 new songs in the past two months. Yeah. It's been crazy. So it's, and I'm just allowing it to kind of come through instead of turn my back on it. And uh, so I'm, I'm feeling, I'm feeling a lot better musically um, than I have in the past year. That's for I sure. I know what you want. If you want me to be true I'll be true to you A lot of musicians love to call themselves the hardest working musician in Canada, but Joe is truly one of the hardest working folks that I know. Normally in the past year, he'd have toured all over the place and done hundreds of shows, but COVID, of course, had other plans. He's made the best of his time, though. Uh, He just announced a new album called Scrapper. I really hope that you'll pre-order that and purchase some of his other albums by visiting him on Bandcamp at joenolan1.bandcamp.com. You can learn more about him at joenolanmusic.com. Joe had a lot more to say about the album, but I thought this episode was probably long enough already. So I saved some of my chat with Joe, and you'll hear that coming up on the May 23rd edition of my other show, Tell the Band to Go Home. You can find that show most places where you find this show or at tellthebandtogohome.com. As always, my biggest struggle with the show is getting it into new ears, so I'd really appreciate it if you'd pass on the info about this episode to a friend, family member, coworker, or acquaintance who might find it interesting. Bring up the show at Book Club or post a link in your favorite Facebook group. Doing those things would really help the show to grow and thrive, and it would mean a lot to me. I hope you'll subscribe to the show and find out more information at flywithyourshadow.com. You can get in touch with me, and I hope that you will, at flywithyourshadow at gmail.com. I'm Jeff Robson, and I thank you very much for listening to this week's episode of Fly With Your Shadow. I hope you'll join me again next time.